Thank you, sir. And I believe uh, this is actually very close to my heart because as we are all from academia. So drawing on the excellent points raised by Professor Titumir and Professor Yusuf, I'll be focusing on one massive uh, obstacle that Bangladesh needs to worry about. Yes, it calls for celebration that we have moved into the LMIC, low middle income country status in 2015, and we are going to attain, well, we are supposed to attain it by 2024, but now UN CP, CDP ex, uh, intervention is 2026, we are going to go for uh, LDC graduation. But there are growing pains. And I call this, and bear with me, it's called the education employment enigma. And this is a key idea of the weaknesses of Bangladesh. We have come up with mass education. We have come up with quantity. And yes, the government and successive governments have played a role. NGOs have played a role. But now I'll quote data. And there is debate about data, so I'll go with the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. I cannot be accused of tampering with the data. So between 2015 to 2017, 1.4 million people entered the labor force. During the same time, 1.29 million people got their jobs. That means one, over 1.1 million people are jobless. That's one data. Number two data, official unemployment rate before COVID, this is before COVID, because COVID is an exogenous shock, was 4.2%. But amongst the youth unemployment, it is over 13%, 10 to 13%. Out of the total unemployed people, around 80% are youth. And it gets even worse because we were told the conventional sense is that as you acquire education, your chances of employment should get better. But what does our labor force survey of 2017 tell us? Now I'm just quoting from here. People with tertiary education, college level education, uh, more than HSA education, 13.4% unemployment. People with secondary education, 28.4%. This has nothing to do with political regimes. This is an endemic weakness, no matter who comes to power. And, if we, we, and we are thumping our chest, and we are saying that we are ready to take on the entire world. But this is a massive skills gap. We are saying that our people from abroad are coming over here, but our, our business owners have no choice. They're competing on a global level. <coughs> You have to run those businesses. We have universities, both public and private, churning in students, mass education. But in terms of skills, we are actually forced to hire from abroad. I believe everyone in this room knows this. And we are going to compete. And we are also coming in with the fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence, quantum computing, blockchain technology, who is going to provide us with this technology? Along with this, even worse, with LDC graduation, I'm just finishing it up, just two more points. With LDC graduation, we have also another growing complaints concern. Into all LDC countries are supposed to enjoy waiver from trips, trade-related intellectual, aspect, uh, intellectual uh, aspects. Now, because of LDC, we are going to waive that exemption in 2026. Now, what will happen to our booming pharmaceutical sector? We are talking about an API, active pharmaceutical ingredients part, but what about supply chain linkage? Who will be the people who will man this? This skills gap, we need donor assistance. We need cooperation. If you are, if uh, official development assistance is supposed to decline, but one of the aspects is that Bangladesh is not fully an LDC. Bangladesh is not fully a low-middle income country. It's somewhere in between. It's a blended economy, as by multilateral organizations' description. And along with this, the last part, we are probably the only NDC who is hosting the biggest refugee concentration in the world, 1.1 billion. And along with this, the problem is donor assistance is only 35%. The rest comes out of the Bangladeshi government packet. So where can we actually use this? And along with this, there's COVID-19. And now there's a Cornwall consensus, which has replaced Washington consensus. That means governments must play a proactive role. But we are saddled with the Rohingya refugee crisis. 
Are we getting any other kind of concession for this? We pay $1 billion worth of tariff to sell our ready-made garments in the United States. Will that be waved away? We're doing a good deed. There should be some official recognition. See, these are questions where we need to engage the international community and ending it up. We are talking about skills. One more thing, every day when I close my eyes, you're talking about competitors. We also need capacity building in terms of identifying our competitors. Vietnam is our biggest competitor. It has already signed an EU free trade agreement in 2020. It is in, we were, we are happy that we joined in uh, RCEP. Vietnam has joined it much earlier. It's already in CPTPP. Our garment share has in fact increased from 75% to 86% from 2000 to 2019. Vietnam has actually gone down from 12.2% to 11.8% within the same time. And they have already overtaken us as the second largest export uh, destination. See, these are, and all of this, and it doesn't matter if we get less assistance, because this is the part of growing up. But we need technological transfer, aid for trade. But again, aid for trade, we know, is being subsumed by donor countries into different packages. And this effective capacity building is not there. And also, the last second, so finishing up, as we graduate, we must also keep into mind that we must be more smarter and must more transparent about providing agriculture subsidies, about providing infant industry support, which will then come under WTO rules and provision. So all those areas, we need greater engagement with the international donor community and the multilateral organizations. Thank you. Sir.